So today is a, a little question and answer session we're going to be doing. So um, we're recording this for everybody who's here, just so you know, totally. Um, this is going to be posted on Don't Move after this is all said and done. Um, but we're just going to have a discussion today about Tai Chi. You can ask questions. And, uh, you know, I think the goal was to have Kelvin, me, Brennan, and John be the um, panel. But there's people like Nicholas here as well and James Tam. So, you know, I think just asking questions and having a discussion about those questions would be a really good format to have here. And, and like Kelvin said, if you can post it into the chat, that'd be really cool. Um, it can be anything Taiji related practice, uh, specific questions. I think there's a question on Facebook that someone can attempt to answer. Um, it seems very difficult to do over, over zoom, but we can try certainly. And, uh, but thanks for everybody for joining. And uh, like we said, this will be up on uh, Facebook after this. So I'm Levi Sowers. I'm the 80th disciple of Master Chen. Uh, this is our third installment of the Practical Tai Chi, Practical Method Tai Chi podcast. And um, joining me is Brennan, who can introduce himself now. Hey guys, uh, Brennan To. I've been practicing Practical Method since 2011. I've uh, been to Daqing Shan five times, uh, currently living in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, John, you want to introduce yourself? I'm uh, John Upshaw. I'm uh, Master Chen's 92nd disciple, and I'm co-organizer of the North American Practical Method Training Camp. And um, <laughs> welcome to my basement. Uh, Kelvin? Sure. Hi, I'm Kelvin Ho. I'm the 97th disciple and I am in Toronto and have been practicing since 2009. Um, so I organized a Toronto workshop and right now hosting uh, a bunch of uh, video classes um, for, for the people in Preco Method. Okay. okay. Uh -huh. Let's go through, we don't have too many people, so let's go through and introduce a few other people. Nicholas, could you could you talk about yourself a little bit? Okay, yeah. Hi, I'm Nicholas, I'm number 70. Uh, I've been practicing, I can't remember since when. <laughs> I'm living in Shanghai right now. And I've uh, been to Shan, gee, I don't know how many times. Way before, when, it, when there was a, Little plaza, the plaza, the little plaza that is there right now, it was a restaurant. That's how long ago. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I actually spent some time on the mountain with you in 2011. My only time to, to Daqing Shan. Pretty cool. That uh, was when the, it was still a restaurant. Yeah. Yep. 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 It was very different. There was one hotel be, well, one health hotel just got done. Um, so, uh, Ong, can you introduce yourself? Uh, Yes, I'm from Bali, Indonesia. Oh, wow. I've been, yeah, I've been uh, training in practical method since 2013. I'm organizing a uh, shop for Master Chen three times in 2016, 2018, and 2019. I've been to Taching San only one time, is uh, last year. That's my experience in practical method. Fantastic. Um, Jerry, can you introduce yourself? Yes, um, I'm Jerry Hopkins. I live in Iowa, about equidistant between Levi and John. And so I first met them um, in 2013 at the, uh, leading up to the uh, workshop in Iowa City. And um, I've slowly been practicing more and more faithfully as the years come by. Goodbye. Jerry's too humble. He's actually been practicing quite a bit and he's he's awesome. So Jerry's been a really dedicated student of practical method and uh, we hope one day to make him a disciple. That's our goal. <laughs> um, all right, who's left? There's Sprint's iPhone. I don't know your name. If you want to introduce yourself, you're welcome to. If you don't want to, you don't have to. Okay. Hi, I'm Fred. Fred. Hey, Fred. Hey, hey, hi. Fred. Frederick so I Wong. started in, yeah. I can't get the video to go. Uh, that's okay, man. 
I started in uh, 2019, uh, just really to gain back my health. And I really found it fascinating uh, to study with uh, Master Chen and all your uh, people that have been helping me along the way. And I'm hoping to achieve my 10,000 ELU by the end of next month. So. Oh, in a year? Almost a year? Well, more than a year, but oh, that's, wild. That's, that's my goal. So that's, that's where I'm headed. Very nice. Let's get started. I thought, I thought one question that was asked right before we got on is, <clears throat> I don't know if anybody has experience training the sword. I, I know John Upshaw and a few others on here do, but what, uh, Brennan, can you re-ask that question? What's the benefit of... Yeah, so, I mean, we do have a sword, both gen and broadsword forms that are we practice within practical method. I don't necessarily see them practiced too widely or consistently. Mm -hmm. So I was asking, you know, John or Kelvin or anyone who does practice it, what benefits they're seeing by doing it, you know, whether it helps the practice or practical method, Tai Chi, um, what you're seeing out of it. John, yeah, you can go first. Uh, my initial response was um, it helps you train the waist. The sword's connected to the waist and the movements. And I also think that it um, teaches you to stay on the line, that the sword is an extension of your arm. And uh, if you go off the line, um, it makes the sword go to the side. Um, and I think it makes you more conscious of <clears throat> the rotations in the body um, when it's connected to the waist and you're moving the sword, you're not going out with your arm. It's um, used, uh, uh, uses the rotation from the body. So um, uh, use of waist and staying on the line uh, has been my experience. The, the way I look at it, yes, I agree with John it's about using the waist, like learning actually not to move the hand by training with the sword, it helps. Because if you're just waving with your hand, your arm gets so tired so quickly. So that's one of the benefits I found. And understanding the alignment like John said, it's also very helpful because when you try to move, there's a there's the rotation uh, of your body as you go through the routine, as well as staying on uh, the line when you say do poking uh, of uh, actions in in the sort as well. It also helps to send the energy to the tip of the sort. What does that mean, Calvin? It means just like when you stretch, the energy has to go to the tip of your finger. And the sword is an extension of your hand. So I think the sword is really interesting as a self-corrective tool. Um, often when we practice, we don't know what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, what's placed, you know, if we're positioned correctly uh, and that's why it's really important to have a good teacher who can hopefully see and notice those sorts of things what other tools or training methods do you guys use to kind of self-correct or notice when you're in or out of position yeah so I'm gonna I'm gonna tack on some stuff here too like for me it was it was really understanding that when I issued power if you will with the sword that it was completely off and um you can feel it. It feels awkward and it's not good. But when you do it a little bit better or a little more correct, you can feel it in the sword, the way the sword moves, the way it, the way it um, sort of like shakes or something like that at the end. And so you can start to feel that alignment and the, the line that exists, like these, these lines, these, in my opinion, mysterious lines that we always talk about. Um, you can really start to feel those more. And I think that's really important for your own practice, like, like, Brennan was just talking about there's these like sort of corrective tools that the sword is one of. And um, it also taught me to be more opened up or like full um, because if you keep the sword too close to you, you just don't, there's, it's like, I don't know. It teaches you to be, to really make these full movements uh, versus these short little robotic type things that are good in some cases, but 
death. I think, I don't know, hopefully you can understand what I'm talking about. It's hard to describe, but <clears throat> it's something I just started retraining the sword after a couple of years and uh, I immediately noticed a bunch of these things. <laughs> so, yeah. Fred, Fred Wong has a question. What's the sword length and the type of steel to practice? The sword length um, is like when you're holding it, that uh, your arm is straight down and it comes up to the tip of your ear. You know, it's, it, it's interesting because I think you can practice with almost any type of material, but as long as the length is okay. So um, there are practice swords that Master Chen sold. Um, I think they're very, very difficult to get nowadays. But you can buy you can buy straight swords online for practicing. So just look around the internet. I think the weight of the sword has is actually very important when you practice the form. You cannot use the very light and flimsy sword. Good point. Like it, like of course you have to build that strength gradually, but you you have to get eventually get to the heavier sword to really get the real benefits from it. Otherwise, you're just doing a routine. If you're learning a routine, I think it's fine. But we, if you really want to train with the sword, you need a weight that's appropriate for your, for your particular condition. Don't, like, it cannot be so light that you feel like if that, uh, moving the, even if you're moving the hand only, your arm doesn't get tired. So without the enough weight, you, you don't get that benefit. I think uh, for more information and for purchasing swords, um, Alan Bellsheim, uh, you can contact him on, on Facebook. He sells swords and he's very knowledgeable about swords. He can modify them to um, your height. Um, I think he has a few more um, that can be purchased. I've um, purchased all of my swords from Alan and um, been very pleased with them. Yes, the next question Leva asks is, how do you describe the lines that we discuss all the time in practical method? <clears throat> That's the question. Does anyone want to? Nicholas, you want to give this one a shot? Sure, sure, sure. How do we describe it? Yeah, how do you describe these lines that we it? talked about? Like, like, let me give you an example. We don't see the line when we start it. Like, all of a sudden, okay. you start to see the line. What exactly do we see? Okay, okay. What is it okay. to you? Because like, like, when you touch, when you touch someone, when you, you know where that line of power is. Generally, I would, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. And so, what is that? What, what, what do you dis What do you see? What do you feel? Uh, remember, Master Chen always had, had in the old days asked people to push the wall. The exercise is to push the wall. Okay, so when you push the wall, why do you? Why is the why is the wall? Um, why are you not able to move the wall? It's because the wall is directly connected to the ground. So if you want to see that line you can see how the wall is connected to the ground and you need to produce that in your body. And I often kind of joke with some of my students and say, I can explain to you Tai Chi in five, five, five minutes. And I have them stand against the wall and I push them and all they have to do is just go like this to bat me away. And that is, them producing that line through the through their backs against the wall, not wobbling or anything like that, and they can produce those those lines that we've been talking about. So my way of seeing the line is to feel it. Then once you felt you have felt it, then uh, you look at Master Chen. I, I I try to not look at Master Chen's hands so much these days. I try to look at his. His uh, his um, waist area, the dong area, and see what is happening there. Kind of kind of block myself like this, and then you often see how he produces that. Even 
in a very brief moment, just before he issues, how those, how that 90 degrees, well, close to or 90 degrees is produced. And actually, if you look at Chen Fa Ke, his, uh, he's, he's got his famous, what, his picture or something like that? There's mm -hmm. a picture of him doing one that pose. But if you look at his crotch area, it's almost like 45 yeah. and then very flat, very yeah, open. 90 degrees line, horizontal line, very open. But you have to kind of stare at it quite, quite um, intently. It's kind of weird scaring, staring at the crotch area. But, uh, but there's another story that I remember Master Chen told me, if I may take more time. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, remember Master Chen said that one time he was very tired and he was watching um, um, Feng's video and then it's been it's, been, it's because he has been watching the videos a lot many, many many times but that one time he was able to see something that really totally grabbed him right so watching the video experiencing it and having a solid object to guide you just like the sword has been guiding you guys so that you're not making things up is how I would describe describe the lines yeah that's so that's that's a really good point and if I yeah, can jump in or, or running can jump in doesn't matter here. If I can jump like or... training with larger people um, than you really makes you not fake it <laughs> and like two of my Students have been very large human beings. Jeff uh, was the first one, Jeff Clevenger, and he's like a Viking. He's like six foot four, you know, 260 pounds. And training with him, and, and he's this kind of uh, pugnacious dude who's like doesn't accept crap from me. And he always wants me to show stuff, do this, do that. And uh, that really helped me learn, quote unquote, where these lines are because. Uh, when you start pushing hands, and I think this also gets into pushing hands and touching other people, you really have to do a lot of that, which is unfortunate during these pandemic times. But pushing hands allows you to feel that, and they'll they'll be fleeting at first. These these lines that we talk about, you'll kind of just know when you feel it because the person will fall over, or you'll feel stronger. There, there's all these weird fleeting feelings that you really, I think, shouldn't concentrate on when you practice or push hands with people you'll just know and eventually those will come more and more and more and it really gets into practicing with other people and pushing hands and I think that's a really important thing. I don't know, maybe Brennan can jump in here too. Yeah, in general, I'd say to describe the lines, the connection from one body piece to another. Um, so Nick used the example of a wall. I think that's a good one and a wall is a very physical sensation. Like it's, it's there immediately. Um, it can be a lot more floaty to say, okay, now connect your hand to the foot. You know, what process does it do that? Um, that's a little bit harder to describe. So maybe you can, you start smaller, right? You connect the hand to the back or the elbow to the back or the shoulder to the claw. Um, and those shorter lines will eventually create a longer line. Um, you know, we talk about other things from the hand to the elbow to the shoulder, and then there being a line from the hand to the shoulder completing the triangle, right? The, the invisible line. And that can also be sometimes confusing. Um, so the, that would be the description um, and how well they're connected can also be very important. And that kind of goes to what Levi was saying where um, you kind of have to practice and test it to see how well you're connected. You know, if we think of the lines and the connection like gears, sometimes the gears are tight together, sometimes they're loose. And if they're loose, maybe the connection isn't as good. So your line isn't as strong. Um, overall, I agree that it takes a lot of time and experience and practice to be able to know what you're looking for, what you're feeling, um, in order to keep looking for what's right, what's wrong. John, anything to add to that or Levi? Yeah, you know, I think when you do start to feel these things, um, and, and we're describing this very like, obtuse thing here this this like sort of mystical thing and when you when you start to feel those things in certain movements you'll want to keep doing it in that certain movement over and over and over again that's like the mind um grasping onto something that it can understand and i think that it's important to get rid of that 
I mean, it is okay to practice that, but you want to try and get it into other, other parts of the body. And Master Chen often says that oftentimes people only have like one move and they'll do it over and over and over again. And I'm, I'm sort of like that. Like I have this one move where I rotate and throw people and like, that's my one move. And like, Brennan has a couple where he like steps behind you and throws you down and he's really quick at it and he's practiced it a thousand times, you know? So it's, you'll learn where you can feel those things and you should take advantage of it. But in reality, we should try to get away from those and try to do it in other positions because it'll make us a more well-rounded uh, Tai Chi practitioner, in my opinion. I think we have uh, lines uh, within ourselves, and then lines that are produced when two people um, are pushing in and connect power, their lines of power. I think the lines within yourself are exactly what Brennan had said. When we have two ends, um, maybe two joints, like Brennan said, the hand and the shoulder and the elbow in the middle. And um, I, one of the things about you know expansion is um, taking that middle dot and pushing it into the line. So when you push um, the middle into the line, that's how we get the outside to move and that's where we get our uh, compression from. And that's how we, uh, one way uh, we become full. I think when we take a look at the lines uh, between two people, if I'm pushing Brennan and Brennan's pushing me, you know, um, I can feel, or um, sometimes I can, you know, is the power coming from his from his rear foot? Uh, what angle it's coming from? Um, and being able to use that line to my advantage. One of the things that we had worked on in New York City, I think it was 2014, is understanding some of what a line is like, what are the components. And we have uh, what Master Shin would say, is the vertical aspect of the line and vertical the vertical aspect of a line is the long end of the line and when we take a look at what's the horizontal part of the line it's the short end of the line so when um say brennan's pushing on me that i um he becomes longer and when he has longer he has more power so if i take my long line and I cross his line. Um, I cross his line so his uh, line becomes shorter. I'm crossing it. I'm, re I'm um, making mine long and his is crossed horizontally, then I'm cutting his line off. So I think there's many aspects and components um, that are involved when we're talking about lines. Any comments about the statements I uh, I have uh, something to add. Uh, so once you actually kind of get an understanding of what that line is, certainly you have to understand it within your body. And you will start to realize uh, when you look at the videos, you can see them. Because if you had the experience, you actually can see them in Master Chan or some other people who are actually trying to have it. And it's, it's more than one line, really. Uh, you, the effects of the Tai Chi requires you basically to have at least two to be usable, have three lines that you're producing. And this could be, say, front hand to rear foot, front foot to the rear shoulder, and then maybe one vertical that uh, going from the head down. Like something like that in order to produce the Tai Chi effect. Uh, so to speak. Um, so learning where that line is, what it means, and, and uh, how to create it is the first step. And to make it usable in push hands, uh, you need to produce more than one line. We, we're, we're certainly are not aware of it when we initially push hands, but, but over time, uh, that's one of the things um, I start to see. And, and you can actually see in some of the videos that Master Chen um, uh, refers to these lines and multiple of them uh, in his videos as well. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Um, so we're going to go on to another question that I 
proposed, and then we're going to delve into this massive question um, that uh, someone asked online, if that's okay with people. So the one, the other one I had, and it's something I think about quite a bit, is how important is the use of language in Taiji, um, consistent vocabulary, etc. And I think this is really important um, for uh, teachers, the, every, anyone who teaches, and anybody who learns, really. What why is it important to use consistent language? Who wants to take that? I'll start it, um, if you guys don't mind. So I think that when we're learning at the beginning, we'll have all sorts of ideas as we learn or listen to this new vocabulary as it applies to Tai Chi. Um, so we're talking about lines, we're talking about open and closed, qua. Um, some people say, oh, am I relaxed? Am I tense? Am I using power? And all of these words, they'll have ideas in their heads as to what it means. Um, and that's, that's very normal. That's very, like when you're starting, you have to connect what you're learning to your previous experiences. Um, as you are around, let's say, more people who practice the same, uh, the same type, and you learn, okay, what's the relevance? How is this being used in what context? Um, it starts to bring you into the world and we're, let's say it starts to bring you into the school of what we're learning here. So if I'm saying, oh yeah, okay, this is where the power transmits from, it's more easily for you to connect that idea to what you're trying to do in your own body. So unless you're using, until you're using similar words to describe similar things, there's an easier connection um, for you to learn. John, do you want to add on to that? I think it's uh, at first it's like like learning a new language, um, and we 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 have to start somewhere like uh, Brendan said, um, and I think it's just over time of listening, observing, and making those connections um, that understanding um, begins to uh, take place. Um, I think the other part, the difficult part is we don't have the physical understanding to connect with the words. So to transmit, you know, understanding from our mind to physical understanding is two different things. But I think once, you know, we're able to touch somebody and we get a physical understanding of what is said, then I think um, there's a potential for meaning to occur. Yeah, I think I think consistency is also another big deal um, in, in Taiji, and it's consistency amongst um, a school of Taiji. So, in, in our case, practical method, we use a very well-defined vocabulary of Master Chen, and I think it's important to maintain that vocabulary for the sake of one, the teacher, sort of some tradition there, but two, you know, when I describe something to my students, and I use, I try to to. To, to use language that Master Chin loses, uses all the time so that when my students go and train with Master Chin, it won't sound different. It won't sound like I was saying some something completely different than what Master Chin was saying, even though I probably was. But when you start using the same language, it makes it easier for people to connect, in my opinion. And so then uh, I often correct my students. So like when I'm training, uh, I have one particular student right now who is, he's very metaphysical, very like out there and he wants to use his own language all the time. And I'm like, no, that's not what we call it. We call it this. And so uh, it's also sort of keeping them in, like when we use language, it keeps us in this like line of, of training that's important. And I think um, language is very important in Taiji. And I think it's important that we try to recreate what Master Chen says in terms of language as well as physical being. Um, what that interpretation is in anybody's head, it doesn't matter. That's meaningless because you will eventually get to where you need to be. And that's, that's something that I think is hard for people to understand is that the um, understanding of the language is completely just as Brennan was getting onto that it's all experience based. And so, uh, you know, someone who practiced karate for 20 years is going to have a very different understanding of what Master Chen is saying, or we're saying, versus somebody who's completely new, right? And uh, I think that's all really important. 